Hey guys, welcome back to the Capital Mindset Show. We're doing another subscriber request, and this time it's going to be BGS, so BNG Foods. Okay, so this one is a consumer staple stock. It focuses on providing different brands uh, to consumers so that they can consume. And uh, as for first thing we're going to do is actually look at the um, uh, price price action, and we can see over the past five years it's actually gone nowhere. It's down, in fact. And it's down about 33% over the long, long term. Uh, we can see that it's not performed well at all. This has been a severe underperformer relative to the rest of the market. Uh, maybe if we factor in the dividend, it's going to be somewhat uh, better or not somewhat. But it should be a lot better. But uh, again, most of the return has probably been from the dividend itself and not really from the share price appreciating over time. Um, we'll take a look at their brands actually right over here. So you guys can pause the video at any point and you guys can... Uh, uh, see if you recognize any of these brands, but just to kind of show you guys uh, different. And by the way, they don't own Einstein bagels. They, they own the rights to sell stuff in the store, by the way. So if you see something that you, you see as a store or a standalone, like a coffee shop, they're not actually owning the coffee shop. They own the, the brand that you'll see in the supermarket. Okay. Like, for example, they don't own Twix. Twix is owned by the chocolate company. Uh, I think it's Hershey's. Uh, but they own the this version of twigs that is sold okay so uh that that's pretty much it for for covering their their brands they have over 50 brands so as an extensive portfolio and the issue sometimes with brands or brand acquisition is the accumulation of lots of goodwill and if you squander those brands because brands have a moat as long as people believe there is value to that product uh to that brand that brand trust so as long as that moat remains high, it's all well and good to buy these brands up. And as long as you maintain a good standing with your customers, perfect, amazing. Um, but now going to uh, the uh, topics about BGS, um, I'd, something that I want to make sure is that they don't have a lot of debt or a lot of goodwill, a lot of uh, intangible assets that they're evaluating or thinking that that's valuable or as valuable as they say it is because in the form or in the event of difficulty or strenuous um, business circumstances, they are not going to be able to actually get the price they believe they will. Okay. It's always going to be a discounted price because I'm, I'm, if I was the other end of the deal, I want a cheaper price as possible. Right. And if I know they're suffering, uh, I'm not going to want to pay as high. So um, goodwill, you shouldn't really count it as actual book value contribution. Okay. So let's go ahead and go to the model. And I got to remember to zoom in for you guys. All right. So, uh, BGS, let's go ahead and let that come in. All right. So analysts have this rating as a hold. So there you go. That's the answer. There we go. That's that. That's all the review we're going to do. Okay. No more further review is necessary. I'm just kidding. But the analysts have it out as a hold price target of 29.13, implying a negative 5.1% uh, downside. Okay. So now we're looking here. I'm looking right here at the smell test that I've been trying to uh, showcase on this channel. The market cap enterprise value, the market cap is lower than the enterprise value. Therefore, we probably have a debt problem right there before I even begin. Um, the model's telling me they're debt heavy, so debt or equity heavy. They have a, a very low uh, estimated WAC, uh, calculated a little bit differently. And then they have a COCA of 3.39%, so it's a low interest rate environment. Uh, so they're, they're using more debt, right? And they're getting actually favorable terms. That's what that's telling me versus like, I mean, we're in a very low interest rate environment. So, um, so dilution accretion. The, ignore that because I think they are not. Yeah. So you, we don't look at that in an event that they're actually buying back shares. Uh, we only looked at if that they're diluting. So ignore that and uh, take a look down here. Uh, that's on a gap basis. So, um, oh, sorry, that's not a gap basis. That's on a cash flow basis. We're going to have to take a look at these cash flows. So these cash flows are not good. Uh, so dividend yield, um, Z score. Okay. So we're already measuring. Uh, ambiguity, actually. So that's ambiguity. And then the model is also saying it's ambiguous. It doesn't under, it doesn't know if this is at risk of bankruptcy. Right there, I'm going to have to discount it higher just because, uh, you know, that that is a concern to me. Okay. Um, and already I'm looking here, remember the smell test up here. Uh, already I can tell that there's a debt problem going on because of the size of this business. They almost have basically as much debt as their the size of the actual market cap. Um, so let's actually go ahead and take a look at the Q ratios and see what we're looking at. Uh, Looking down over here, okay, exactly what I was kind of afraid of. 
the cash ratio is extraordinarily low uh, and they seem to have been annihilating it for whatever reason, something they've been spending on. Uh, they are uh, seemingly trying to get somewhat of a semblance of control in that long-term debt. They were down about 2%, but they're basically where they are. Uh, the current ratio is pretty good, by the way. I don't want to think that I just glossed over that. It's pretty good. Uh, but however, what are they evaluating on those current assets? Probably a lot of inventory. Inventory, some, especially in the food industry, is not actually valuable the way you think it is because it, ex sorry, it expires. So you're not going to actually get the actual value. Um, so long, or the value that they say, you'll get the actual value, <laughs> but you won't get the value that they say. All right. So gross profit, um, it's declining. We don't want to see that. We want to see rising or, or maintenance of gross margins. We are being uh, hammered in by uh, uh, producer price inflation. So this isn't very surprising. They may not have as much pricing power as other companies. That may be the case. Uh, operating margins are actually up over the longer term, but really far down from 2018 and 2020. This is the gap fluctuations that we're discussing because that's going over um, the actual operations of the business that they might be expensing. Uh, net profit margins are also telling me a similar story, actually more of a steady decline over since 2017. And I imagine since 2017, this has been a very bad performer. Let's actually review that. And yeah, let's see right there. So since 2017, it's actually down. So the, the model or the, the ratios in this instance, the DuPont analysis is telling me that that's kind of like the story that we're getting from this. Okay, so ROA, ROE. ROE is 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 actually pretty good at 10% for something like this. 15% uh, obviously was better in 2020, uh, but you know we see that decline again, but that's coming in from that net income, all right? That net income's coming down. All right, let's actually take a look at the earnings quality, the unique measure we like to look at. And uh, we see it's all over the place, actually. So 2020 was the big jump. So I imagine there was a big jump in 2020 in the, in the share price, because remember, we talked about that correlation. And well, I mean, you could obviously say, Oh, yeah, yeah. You see, it was pre-pandemic. You know, it's pre-pandemic. They jumped up. They started. They started their jump before then. So we can't say it was entirely the pandemic. Okay. Um, as I was about to say, an argument could be made. Everything went up in 2020. I was like, yeah, this one didn't really. This one went up before before the pandemic started. And then we see it went down in uh, 2019, and then down in 2020. Okay. So the correlation is really strong. I'm telling you. So um, I like that. All right. Book value per share. I don't really care about this for this business. Okay, this is what I'm going to be concerned about. I want to know why is this happening. So we're going to actually take a look at the financial statements and the and statement of cash flow specifically, and we're going to see what the heck is going on that's causing that. All right. So taking a look over here. Okay, so, you know, to be expected, they're not as strong as something like Pepsi. Uh, but they, they, they're not let's see if they're improving at least. Okay. So some things are improving. Day sales outstanding is improving. Cash conversion cycles remained about the same. I wouldn't consider that changing. Days accounts payable is staying the same. Most things are staying the same. 2020 was just a nice year for some of these metrics, but you know, more or less staying the same. Okay. Uh, so that's fine. All right. Let's go ahead and take a look at the uh, uh, statement of cash flows. And then I'll highlight this. So this is uh, cash flows from operations. This is capital expenditures down here. And uh, let's take a look. Yeah, just making sure I, I am correct. All right, so uh, that is quite interesting. So we have, what, what is causing this, this big fluctuation? Hmm. So this one right here, this line item, what is this line item? 153, changing accounts payable. Is that, is that changing accounts payable? Let's do this. No, it's the one above it. I, for, again, for me, it's really zoomed in. I have to do it this way. Otherwise, it's too zoomed out for you guys. But you can kind of see the struggle I go through. I have to go back and forth. Um, at least I don't know if it will look like that in the end video. All right, change in inventories. All right, so it's change in inventories. Okay, so that's not that big of a deal. Um, the, what change in inventories basically means is that they're expensing a lot of cash to get more inventory. Okay, it could be, we don't know how much of that cash is actually just increased cost on them. Uh, but they're they're expensing it to get inventory to then sell to their to their uh, customers, uh, because you know if in order to sell anything you you have to have the thing to sell. So it's not that much of a concern because we can think of that inventory as future sales. So uh, we see that in uh, 2020 and in uh, 20. Uh, 2018, they had positive in this in this respect, which means they had inventory on hand that they were just kind of getting rid of. And then they sold or they got more cash for inventory than they paid for new inventory. Okay. 
Uh, we see that in uh, in 2020, they probably the supply chains were kind of a little bit messed up. So it was kind of high actually for relative what it's normally. Okay. So that's probably what's the big effect that's that's causing the massive drawdown in the cash flows in both years of 2019 and 2021. All right. So on that note, let's actually take a look at the summer report and uh, think about what the uh, growth rates we can assume in order to get a uh, a good feel of what the cash flows are worth. Now that change in inventory, that is still cash that's kind of going out. So you you could argue that, for example, last year when they didn't when they had a really positive uh, one that that should be the cash flows. Well, no, not necessarily because they need to refill the inventory. That's actual cash that needs to be taken out of the business. Uh, and then you might argue at the same time that this year's an anomaly. They have to spend more than normal to, to get more inventory. And that's that's also true. But I, I'd say it's somewhere you know down the middle. So if we take a look at the um, uh, cash flows assumptions that we're going to assume, I'd probably try to like even it out if I wanted to be the most accurate in my assumptions. But if we're going from these numbers, I, I would say that we are going to be quite conservative uh, or not quite, very conservative. I'd say if, if you wanted to be, again, extremely precise in your evaluation, you want to come up with some sort of understanding of what is that uh, healthy point. But there are a lot of uncertainties, for example, with the uh, producer um, producer price uh, index. So a lot of uh, costs are rising, whether or not they're able to pass that on to consumers is yet to be seen. I'm going to bet, or not bet, but I'm going to assume that they might be able to or may be able to over time. So then that should kind of fix itself out, all right? So let's start with our discount rate of 10% at market average. So if they were to not grow at all, that's that's what we would expect. So it's, apparently they've grown on average about 8.16%, and this is taking over the um, the sales growth that we will translate over to cash flows. So let's assume an 8%. So an 8%, it's quite terrible. And then this is basically because uh, we have to probably normalize those cash flows, okay? So um, the model is going to be thinking this is a very... Um, uh, bad business. Okay. So, uh, just simply because the, the, the cash flows are so low. So if, if that's the case, we're actually going to take a look down here and see what we can do in terms of our assumptions. So if we see like a recovery period for the cash flows or the current cash flows, um, we can see that, uh, let's take a look. Uh, I'd, I'd change this to five years. Okay, so if, if they can grow the cash flows back, that would imply a, yeah, that, that's still implying a, a very high growth rate. Um, yeah, that's still, that's still a decent growth rate. So yeah, that, that's, this, is not, uh, this is not looking too good for this business, okay? Because we're, we're assuming <laughs> a recovery period of like one year and I'm being very generous with that. So if I'm, if I'm implying a growth rate of 8%, I'm actually above that. Uh, so let's see what we'd have to then assume. Yeah, even at a 20%, that's, this is, okay. So this is uh, very concerning uh, because now I'm, I'm implying a lot more growth than just the recovery, uh, getting back to these uh, uh, cash flows over the course of these uh, years. So, yeah, let me see. All right, we're back. And uh, I had to make some a quick adjustment to the, to the calculation because there was an error and when I uh, did something, some shenanigans. So this is actually the uh, calculator actually working properly now because I noticed that the numbers were way off and um, uh, it was mainly to do with the, the cash flows one. So it was a cell that was doing the wrong thing. But anyway, for now, this is kind of how I read this. So this is basically the uh, current cash flows, the max cash flows that they ever had. And then this implies the years in terms of recovery. So this is the recovery calculator. So if, for example, we wanted to get from here to here, uh, this is actually where we would uh, want to say the, the max growth and recovery would be, right? This would be the compound annual growth rate. Okay. Now, but here's the thing. We want to actually assume that based off of the current business environment, what would be a more probable growth rate longer term? So it implies the recovery, right? And then going forward, it, it continues. So we care about this column over here, okay? The, these percentages. So if you think they recover in a single year, they're gonna have a massive growth in cash flows for one year. And then, then afterwards, you, if you average that out, it averages to 37.89%. So for example, if we put 37% right here, it actually shows that it's 
a relatively undervalued. Now you might think, for example, it's not going to recover in one year. It's going to take a couple of years for things to kind of normalize. You see the percentages actually come down. It may not even recover for a while. So maybe nine years before they ever see cash flows at that rate again, or even 10 years. And you can see the percentage rate at that point is just 28.9%. So like, for example, we put that in 28.9%. Okay, so you see now with that, the cash flows are undervalued. So that's kind of telling you that that's what the market's kind of, um, sorry, overvalued. That's what the market's kind of pricing in somewhere in, in this range of uh, recovery. And that would be the market average rate of return about 10%. Okay, so then going back to this calculator, because again, these are all tools that help us uh, make our uh, analysis. So I'm looking down here and I think, for example, they, I think five years is, is a feasible amount of time, five or six years. Uh, but you know, even with that, I think like it's a uh, 31%. Oh, that's uh, not the right. <laughs> that's not 31%. So it's a uh, 31. There we go. So 31% compounded. You see, we're still at the overvaluation. Uh, and then that was applying what year? That was implying seven years. Okay. So then if they recover, let's say four years, let's plug that in 34%. So at 34%, we're actually in, in the in the go zone. Okay. But again, we're only discounting it at 10%. What happens if we start to discount it more, right? 12%. Okay. Now we're out. Okay. Because now we have to assume a recovery rate of one year, which is uh, 37. I don't think that that's uh, feasible. And when I say recovery, I mean, getting back to those cash flows, because again, you could make the argument either way that that high amount of cash flow was uh, an anomaly, right? And then you could also make the argument the low cash flows now are an anomaly. So that's why we're using the recovery calculator. We're not just going off of today's cash flows. That would be very elementary analysis. Uh, we want to actually, you know, kind of normalize things and, and, and think about what the numbers are showing us, not just blindly plug them in and just, you know, do an analysis like that. Okay. So even if we assume these meager buybacks, because these are really basically token buybacks at this point. Uh, it doesn't really change much, right? These are token buybacks. So basically for what, what I'm seeing here is that there's a lot of uncertainty. I'd have to assume a tremendous amount of growth slash recovery. Um, again, the cash flows look very different from the gap net income. So you could argue that the gap net income is actually a better indicator of the underlying business fundamentals. Uh, I think that's, again, what gap was technically designed to do. So it's not, <laughs> well, duh. And so... Um, uh, the, the PE looking at 23.5 right now. And what, what is it according to uh, uh, Google? Yeah, 23.81. Okay, so we're, we're basically in line. There's also another thing I wanted to point out. So you can go here and uh, let's go to B&G Foods and right here. So their short interest is about 15.76%, which is uh, quite interesting. So that's, that's a pretty high uh, short interest. And, uh, you know, that's, that's indicating that there's a lot of people that think this company has a lot of troubles, right? And so again, to highlight again, what the model is telling me, the model doesn't, under, doesn't know what's going to go on with, with, in terms of bankruptcy. It doesn't understand it. That's why it's a NA, right? It's, um, I don't know. That's what it's telling me. And then the Altman Z score of 1.41 is indicating the same thing. So again, going back to our recovery calculator, there's a lot of assumptions I'm making in terms of when they're going to be able to recover these cash flows back. Right. I do think that the inventory is not that big of a deal, but you know, cash is cash and cash is what I can put in my pocket at the end of the day. Cash is what pays the dividends. Cash is what pays the buybacks. So if you're spending all the cash on inventory, you know, I can't take that cash, obviously, but it's not as big of a concern as other forms of expenses in the cash uh, flow statements would be. OK, so uh, that's kind of my take on uh, BGS Foods. Um, interesting in terms of how the plethora of brands that they own, but uh, it, it wouldn't be for me. Uh, it is. Mm, I wouldn't say it's that cheap. It, it's kind of like, um, it's, it's, it's not there yet. It's not in that sweet spot of, oh, it's, it's dirt cheap. I think it was at one point, and if we, we go back, because I don't want to make this video too much longer, but if we go back here, it was very cheap. It was extraordinarily cheap. And we could probably have made very good assumptions at this point here and been okay. Okay, so... Uh, that's, that's all I'm going to say for that. So on that note, guys, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you guys like content like this, go ahead and feel free to leave a like. If you have any other uh, subscriber requests, go ahead and leave them down below and I'll see you guys on the next video. Have a good one. Bye.